So um, my so my name is obviously Adam Smith. I'm a founder and chief executive now of the Real Junk Food Project, which mm. is a how can I describe it? It's an organisation that tackles surplus food and mm. um, uses a circular economy model to allow people to have access to it, no matter what. So people can give time, money, and skills and pay as they feel to gain access to that food. Yeah, um, been doing that for seven years now, and I'm Leeds born and bred, and the Yorkshire lad. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, doing doing things that people are viewing as quite radical at the moment, which I struggle with because I don't see feeding people with food as radical. radical. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of speaks volume of the state that we're currently in for for you yeah. to be deemed as a radical. Because even when yeah. you watch the Marcus Rashford story, which you just recently mentioned, if you go online and read various comments in regards to people's opinions about it, you have one side who see the wonderful and humanitarian side of it, and then you've got the other side which tends to be quite idiotic that tends to see deem it as a political move or something extremely radical, which is seen as outside of the norm. And I'm like. Well, feeding yeah. people and feeding kids in particular shouldn't be seen as outside of the norm. It shouldn't be seen course, as radical. Course, yeah. yeah, I mean, I have issues with it from a perspective like, um, you know, a multi-million pound footballer was able to get on the phone with the Prime Minister and all of a sudden the day after, £180 million pound was released to feed children yeah. in schools. Yeah. And there's people like me and others that have been campaigning and, mm. uh, and distraught with what's going on on the ground for many, many, many years. And all of a sudden mm. this footballer just got to my phone. And I mean, it's great for him. I mean, especially... Um, as, a, as a black football as well, given mm. what's been happening politically recently around the world. Um, give me a second, sorry. Yeah, that's right. No, I did that out. <laughs> um, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> With what's been happening uh, around the world politically as well, so mm. for a, a young black footballer especially to uh, to come out and to be so passionate about something that uh, he's also been through as well. Yeah. Uh, he, he's great from a campaign's point of view, but the kind of uh, ideology of it and how it went about, maybe I wasn't too aligned with because I believe mm. that um, there are other issues that come attached with feeding people, especially feeding people, uh, young people food uh, that I deal with, especially around the waste element of it. Um, and there was a lot of that involved, unfortunately. But I mean, it's great. It's, it's great. And, it's, and what he's done is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I just think that it's unfortunate that somebody of his capacity has had to do this. Yeah. Um, and I think that yeah and it's strange to consider what it takes for um action to be taken because yeah. at the end of the day these issues were there prior to that and the funds <laughs> were there prior to that as well but it, it does why take it, yeah why, uh, not done with, why was it not being done why you know i always try and look at the root of the problem rather than trying to plaster over cracks Mm. So the fact that Marcus Rashford has highlighted an issue which is obviously very serious and something mm. that should be dealt with from a political perspective, uh, I promise you right now, Francis, that uh, come the end of 2021, we'll be dealing with exactly the same problem. Oh yeah, most definitely. I know. Solve anything. It's just with most of these, it seems like a phase, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and this all like hashtagging of like hashtag holiday hunger or hashtag food poverty and stuff. It's like we shouldn't be glamorizing these issues. We should be trying to deal with them at the root of the problem. Why are people having to send their children to school hungry? Why are they not affording to be able to buy food to be able to feed their children? Why are schools being so dependent on to provide food above and beyond their curricular activities when they're not designed to do that? And why is uh, somebody of Marcus Rashford's magnitude having to come out and be so distraught with what's going on? Because not only has he gone through it, but he realises it's still happening on a bigger scale. For, for, for action to be had and you know and it was the instant reaction to it which was really alarming because it's like it was like he was fearful of what Marcus Rashford potentially could do if nothing had been done yeah. whereas people on the ground like me you know if I go to Boris Johnson and say there's thousands of kids going to school hungry and some of them the last time they get a, a warm meal is their free school lunch the day before yeah. he'll turn around to me and go who are you Marcus Rashford does it and if there isn't seen to be some action, mm. the consequences are greater than the consequences of what's happening to the people on the ground. And that's yeah. the thing that really troubles me when it comes to politics is because Marcus Rashford clearly did it with his hand on his heart because he cared. Mm. Um, and for such a young black male in this day and age, given everything that's happened with the Black Lives mm. Matter movement, to come out uh, and put his head up the a parapet and speak out about something he's passionate about is incredibly great. And he got honoured for it, and uh, rightly so. 
But um, he should never have had to be in a position to do that. He's yeah. a footballer. He's a footballer yeah. wins some trophies. Yeah. The, 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 issue between, the issue between glamorizing and highlighting is one that I'm trying to like play out in my head at the moment because I, I understand the whole... Um, I understand the issue behind glamorizing something. We shouldn't be glamorized. But also, sometimes when things get glamorized by particular individuals, it does, it does, it does highlight an, an issue which then sort of like sparks a conversation. Yeah, so, what's happened? Marcus Rashford has highlighted it. And yeah. what's happened is there are other people that have glamorized it. So mm. you've now got funding bodies that will give you funding if you feed holiday hunger, you know, like mm. you feed hungry children or food poverty and all these kind of key words that people are using right now that I come across every single day. Yeah. For me, poverty is poverty. I don't see anybody going around not feeding their children, driving around in Lamborghinis. Mm. Um, if you're suffering from poverty, poverty affects us in all ways of life. Uh, you know, you have these uh, judgment, judgmental comments around people on benefits sat at home with widescreen TVs and mobile phones. Well, why can't they have mobile phones? Why can't they have widescreen yeah. TVs? Yeah. For you to decide what they can and cannot have just because mm. they're on benefits. And if somebody's got into a position where they can afford to buy themselves a, t- a widescreen TV, well done, good for them. Mm-hmm. You know, and if, if we can empower people out of these positions of poverty, because it affects all of us in a very relative way, and mm. um, we ju- we're so judgmental about it, so people sat on going, oh, what's the point? I might as well just sit here watching my ice cream TV on my phone, getting free handouts of food, because that's how society deems the way I should behave and should act. Yeah. But instead of encouraging it and supporting it and empowering people out of those positions, we look down on these people for doing so. And I think we're just far too judgmental when it comes to stuff like this. And what happens is, is that other third sector organisations and charities go out and try and target these type of things. So they try and target, from a funding perspective, children who are suffering from holiday hunger, well, I promise you they're also suffering from other forms of poverty and hunger, not just during outside of school term time. Mm. Um, but we only, we only try to target that little kind of niche because it becomes glamorized. Like, look at yeah. us, we're feeding children who are suffering from holiday hunger. Well, what about the rest of the year? You know, what about, you know, all the other issues that these people are facing? Why do we not tackle it, tackle it all as one yeah. single uh, objective? And that's the bit that I struggle with, is that the Jamie Olivers, the Marcus Rashfords, the David Attenborough mm. of the world, incredible campaignists, uh, uh, they highlight and give a lot of attention to some serious problems from environmental issues to school dinners to obviously the, mm. the children going hungry, uh, respectively, through all those three people. But then it becomes glamorized and becomes cool and yeah. gets half pags assigned to it. It's like, yeah. no, 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 and, no, no, no. And the thing no. is, trending nowadays, when you trend, it's only momentary. Like you trend for a bit and then it disappears, then oh. on to the next thing the following week. So you're not actually dealing with yeah. the core fundamental issues. Oh, but okay. What would you say, if you was to highlight, what would you say is the core fundamental issues that needs to be dealt with in order to solve this problem? In regards to... The, in regards the, to hunger in particular, yeah. We we have a very, very paradoxical food system, not just in the UK, but across the world, where mm. we have a billion people on the planet that don't have access to food, and we have a billion tons of waste. Yeah. Um, how can we have waste, hunger, and, and a food that people are consuming at exactly the same time? Now, these aren't happening in poor countries or war-torn countries anymore. These are happening in Leeds, in Manchester, yeah. and London, right on our doorstep where you've got a supermarket donating food to a food bank and then people having to queue up because they're in need and then the supermarket's also throwing food away. Um, it's paradoxical. So unfortunately, and I've, I've just done a podcast before this, prior to this, and, and mm-hmm. somebody asked me the same question and I said, look, these problems can be changed instantaneously if it affected profit. And it's it oh, yeah, falls it all the way down to that. Yeah. If yeah. The supermarkets were not making as much profit as they did, food waste would stop tomorrow. Which yeah. it would uh, indirectly have an impact on hunger uh, and all the other things that come associated with it because there's an element of sustaining problems of hunger and poverty in order to sustain waste. Mm-hmm. So where does all this waste go? Well, let's feed it to the poor people. Well, we don't have any poor people. Well, let's create poor people and we can feed this waste to them. And let's keep poor people being mm-hmm. poor so we can keep feeding food waste to them. And both problems become sustained and intertwined with one another so that they can be sustained, so that the bar problems can kind of be managed or coordinated or yeah. controlled in some way, shape or form. Instead of stripping it right back and going, let's stop feeding food waste to poor people, let's deal with poverty as a separate issue, and let's mm-hmm. deal with uh, food waste as an environmental issue, because it is an environmental issue. Well, most definitely. Poverty is a political thing. Look what happened at the beginning of COVID. Homelessness disappeared overnight. 
Yeah. One yeah. foul political movement swiped homelessness off the streets. Everybody was in a residence. Well, well some places there's more there's more empty houses than there's homeless people. So that's 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 a fact. Well, yeah. I mean, we're talking logical here, Francis, but so yeah. why are those people not in the houses? Why? Why? This is not, this is why I struggle with the politics. Is that mm. these issues around hunger and poverty and waste and stuff that we have around the world. Mm. Are really simply dealt with from a political perspective if their politics aligned with the people on the ground because me and you are going there's an empty house there and there's a person on the street mm. why not put that empty house and uh, the person in that empty house that makes sense surely it makes sense i know it's bigger than that i know it's more complicated and complex than that but if we started looking at it from that kind of perspective maybe we could create change much much quicker maybe we wouldn't have the issues mm. that we're currently facing and for yeah. some reason, politics don't seem to align with the way of thinking in society. No, most definitely. Um, I, I heard you. I heard you mention something interesting in one of your um, recent interviews, which I wasn't aware of, and that was in regards to waste and how um, some food banks are more wasteful than um, mm -hmm. than was it stores or um, than supermarkets. Um, can you, can you explain that a bit further? Because I was under the assumption that food banks completely get rid of all of the the the, the food that they receive from various um, sources. This is another thing like since 2011, 2012, we've got an increase of food banks. I think when I first started the project, there was around 60 to 100 food banks in the UK, roughly, uh, yeah. some independently owned, some owned by a large uh, religious institution. Mm. Um, My now, church does one as well on a, on a Friday, every Friday. Yeah, it's probably an independent one. Though. There's, mm. there's, a, there's a big organisation that kind of manages maybe half food banks in this country. Mm. Um and the rest are done through churches and through individuals and community centers and stuff like that. And uh, I think there's thousands of them now. Uh, and there's more and more than ever before. And what happens when I first started out in 2012, 2013, was that we were intercepting more food from food banks than we was from retail. And the reasons why is because people were donating the wrong type of food. And these food banks were not designed to deal with storing vast quantities of certain types of food. So the reasons why they ask for things like tinned meat or pasta or non-perishable ambient products is because it's very, very easy to store and it's very, very easy to turn over. So a small tin or, 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 a, or, a, or a bag of pasta is really, really easy to manage and it can last for quite a while. And you can store it safely. But when it comes to like fruit and veg and when it comes to chilled items, frozen yeah. items, these people obviously cannot deal with this uh, product. This is what we specialise in. Um, mm more than anything else and you know one of the interesting stories i had about in 2013 was um a food bank that was donating some tinned artichokes to the real jump food project yeah and when i asked why because this stuff was perfectly sealed perfectly in date perfectly edible and they said all oh, the type of people that were queued up to food banks wouldn't want to eat tinned artichokes and i was thinking well who are you to make that judgment but also we've kind of got a point um so what was happening is that as a society, we felt like we had done good and uh, morally for that day, we had done a good deed yeah. by donating some of our excess or buying some tins from a supermarket and donating to a food bank. But actually, it wasn't the right type of things. And that's why food banks now really persist on getting their message out about the type of things that they need. Yeah. And I don't think that's the type of things that people should be eating. Like, I'm vegan and, and I eat plant-based and mm. having a tin of spam and a, and a, and a bag of pasta uh, nutrition isn't, <laughs> yeah, isn't going to do you any good and um, yeah. and then uh, and then there was issues around um, some of the service users of food banks that didn't I mean if somebody's coming up at a food bank and they need food they're not sat at home in a luxury house you know they've mm -hmm. not got cleaners and butlers and stuff around them it, ju it just isn't the case and you know we found out that some of the people that were service users for food banks didn't even have a tin opener or they didn't have the capacity yeah. to cook, whether it was the education to cook or the resources or they'd have the electricity switch up because they couldn't afford their bills. Mm. So we were providing them with this food, like here's some bag of pasta, right? Make some, you know, make some carbonara. Make an assumption like, that they can make it. Yeah. yeah, and going, well, that's great, but I don't have electricity and I don't have a cooker or I don't have a tin opener or I can't even, I don't even know what a carbonara is. Um, so then, yeah, you're making these assumptions and making these judgments on what people should have. So what happened as a consequence of that is that all this food that was diverted to food banks, and it's round around the time of austerity when the Tories obviously implemented the austerity measures, mm. there was obviously more and more people need access to food, more and more food was being wasted than ever before, and more and more of it was given to food banks. But they just didn't have the infrastructure to store it correctly, to redistribute it correctly, and the type of foods that was being donated to them wasn't exactly what they were able to use, or their services yeah. were able to use. And so we were getting all of it diverted to us. 
And it was getting to the point where we were like, educating people and saying, giving to a food bank isn't necessarily the right thing to do. I believe that we shouldn't have a single food bank in this country. I feel like we should be ashamed that we've got one food bank, right. given the fact that we've got so much waste. Yeah. And given the fact that as a nation, a very, very tiny island, remember, we have got so much access to food. It's unbelievable. Yeah. From growing, manufacturing, producing, retailers, more supermarkets and every corner, every floor, more express stores. There is a lot of access to food in this country. There's some rural areas, and obviously that's that's all. But, but instead of food banks, what should we have? Because as a, as a normal person who's not actually actively involved in the industry, so I wouldn't understand how the process works like like yourself. So whenever I've donated to food banks, I feel great about myself, thinking that I've yeah. fed, some, not knowing all that you've told me now that potentially that food could go to waste. So what, what should it be instead of? Francis, that's part of our humanity. Like we should be doing that. We should be trying to support other people that may have less than us. That's yeah. part of being human beings, and we should encourage that and embrace that, and 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 and, and support that as much as possible. But the the model of a food bank doesn't quite work. So a lot of it's been tested. People mm. only get a certain amount of provisions. I mean, there are some independent food banks. Maybe the one that you mentioned, where people can just turn up and they can just take get food. Yeah, Friday they, they cook the food there. So our church, we, we they cook the food there. They prepare they prepare breakfast, lunch, dinner, all all on site on the day. So it's not yeah. like coming in and picking up bits that's been there for yeah. months on end. It's all done in house. It's great. I mean, the Sikhs have been doing it for millennia. You know, in their yeah. temples, where people go yeah. and they sit in the temples. And that food there actually is great. I went there for a wedding yeah. once, and it offered me to Great model. Yeah, some. I mean, uh, all of kind of the, the kind of. Uh, religions and faiths of all for millennia mm. being feeding people a community. Um, these models are great, but the food bank model itself is very restrictive and it's uh, invasive. And, mm. and you know, it, it tests people based on it, there's some form of judgment involved in like uh, how poor are you to receive this food and what type mm. of food you should be receiving and how often you should be receiving it. Now, I believe, and obviously it's very radical. I know we talked about radicalization of, of concepts previously based around food, but. If we stopped every single food bank tomorrow, I think two things would instantly happen. I think the focus on waste would instantly um, be exceeded. And all of a sudden we'd realise just how much food is actually wasted that's diverted to food banks that could have instead been not made in the first place or at least uh, sold through yeah. supermarkets. And then secondly, I think we would capture the people that really need support better than what we're doing. Because at the moment, you've just got a congregation of people going up to food banks and using them because they're there. Mm -hmm. And now there's all these stats and figures coming out saying there's a rise in the, in the need of food banks. But there's only a rise in the need of food banks because there was more and more food banks than ever before. So they're much more accessible and more people can use them than before. And they are used when people are finding themselves in situations where they're struggling and they're able to go use them. That's absolutely great. But what's happening is that waste is being used to solve these problems. And we're not tackling the issues of surplus, yeah. environmental impacts of all this food that's been created. Instead, we're just trying to feed it to people that need it. Um, some of these people are really, really need it and not being captured properly. And I think as a society, we could capture the people who really needed support and support them better if we didn't have food bank models where all of it becomes very convoluted and you're just feeding hundreds and hundreds of people a day and people are just coming and taking bags of food and just turning up and taking a bag of water. Yeah. You're yeah. not actually solving a problem, you're just plastering over cracks. And if yeah. anything, you're sustaining the need and the, de and the de dependency on it, if anything. We're not actually empowering these people to get out of these situations to get better and to have better lives and to provide better for themselves and their families. You're just basically saying, here's some free food, come and take it and do what you want with it. Yeah, most definitely. Um, we're going to get into the, the formula that you have set up um, um, currently in regards to like rural um, junk food. But before that, can you, I know you've probably gone over this story a million times. Can you tell us what was happening in your life about 10 years ago that kind of started the process of you um, now reaching a stage where you're doing the work that you do? You, you went through like pretty dark times, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, I was dead. <laughs> it was as simple as that. I was, I was mm. fine with a car uh, by the police. Uh, they triangulated my last text message to my friend and uh, they found me in a field and I'd been sucking on exhaust fumes for several hours. My skin was black and um, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd had a serious attempt at suicide and fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on obviously which angle you come at, but um, there was uh, illegal substances in my body. Um, I think I had cocaine and maybe something else and um, it just kept my heart beating. Obviously, if anybody knows about first aid, you don't check somebody's pulse when you're doing first aid. You check their airways and they, you know, get them in the right position. And so my heartbeat was missed by a police officer that wasn't properly trained. 
Um, and the, you know, he, he missed my pulse and pronounced me dead at the scene and, and took me to hospital, which obviously when I wasn't dead and um, it took me three days to come round. But prior to that, uh, the previous 25 years um, had just been an absolute nightmare of uh, trauma and uh, situations and scenarios, which I'm, I'm currently writing about in my book of all these uh, difficult things that I've got myself into through abuse at a young age all the way to um, being remanded into custody to um, uh, to going into care to being sectioned into mental health hospitals to self-harm uh, you name it there's pretty much nothing that I haven't uh, been through or suffered uh, which led to the to the point of where I was found dead and obviously coming out of that moment there's not many people on the planet right now that can tell that story mm. that can say that they were at Death Star pretty much and uh, they're still here to tell the story now and uh, I think nobody truly understands unless you've been through it and I don't speak to enough people who have been through that experience in fact I don't know if I know anybody else actually that, um, that has been through that and come out of it I don't think people truly appreciate um, the impact it has on you like you will, I will never forget that day that I woke up in that hospital um, and I will never forget everything that happened to me uh, to get me to that stage and the depths that you go to and the real, real depths that you have to go to to, to potentially end your life. You know, there are people that cry for help and there are people that cry for attention. There's people that hurt themselves. But to really, I mean, one of my friends said it to me afterwards was, um, you know, I had no intention of coming back from that. You know, that was it. That was the end. Um, and when you make that decision and you go through that process, it does have a massive impact on you. And if you survive it, there's only two ways to go, really. You either go back and kill yourself and do it properly, mm. or you tend to turn that energy into something positive. Uh, and I'd done all the negative stuff already. And one of my other friends said to me, mm. you might as well stop doing this now because you're not very good at it. <laughs> got a point. You, so, you always need mace ladder, don't you? What, 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 did, that, did that completely help change your perspective of life in regards to like motivating you to do what you do now? Yeah, like going not, through that dark stage? Yeah, I mean, it's not like this kind of existential kind of light at the end of the tunnel yeah. kind of like this kind of stuff. It wasn't anything like that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There was a series of events that led after that where I decided that I was never going to be in that situation again. I didn't quite know how that was going to happen. Uh, I still had these issues in my life that I had to deal with. Um, even now to this day, I still make mm -hmm. mistakes. I still do things wrong. But I will never be in a position where um, I am at those depths. You know, I have two children now. Um, I, I've got my own home and I've got a successful project which I, which I manage and yeah I mean I still have some dark days and you still have doubts and you still make mistakes mm. and you still mess up and I still hurt people mm. not as much as what I used to do but you know you, you do um, and I just think it's about how you deal with those things now and I think it's just um, I was channeling my energy into things that had negative outcomes and I was thriving on self-destruction and now I thrive on the positive outcomes and I mm. change and affect people's lives for the better. And uh, from a human perspective, I don't think there's anything better than that. And I don't care how much money or how rich people are, how successful they are. If you can have somebody come to you and say that they stopped doing something or you changed their lives for the better, and you had such an impact on their lives for just being or doing what you're already doing, uh, it's one of the most powerful things. And Luckily for myself, I've now affected millions of people across the world. For the, oh, that's for the amazing. <laughs> Would you say you're able to highlight like one, one or two things that helped you overcome during this period? Like, or was it was it something significant? Because with most people yeah. that I speak to that have been through these particular situations or, or scenarios, um, I think the running theme at the moment has been family. I don't know what, at what stage you had your family, but um, the large gentleman who I spoke to, he, he, he had gone through extreme like substance abuse and he had a family at the time. And there was the turning point where he was sober for like, he said a five minute window for the first time ever. And he looked at his family when he was sober and that completely, he had a massive slap in the face because he had never been sober for the two years that his child was born. So that five minute window and him noticing, wait, I've got a family now. I actually got a family and that, that was it for him. Uh, for me, I didn't have that um, whatsoever. And the, the, the moments for me was, um, I, I, I recently going through a process of being diagnosed with autism. I have high mm. functioning autism. And my brain was always wired a very different way to most people's. Mm. And I always saw the world in a very black and white way. Yeah. And all these gray areas that I was creating didn't make sense to me. And uh, they caused a lot of trauma and issues for me. 
So first and foremost, it was I was going to work on myself. Um, and then secondly, I decided that I was going to leave everything and run away from all my problems. So I literally just disappeared to Australia yeah. and you know, I saved up a bit of money and went and left and went to go see the world. And I think uh, traveling, going around the world amazing, and, yeah, and, and it. interacting with people, especially from an, uh, an English person's perspective, because I believe after traveling the world, uh, generally people in England are very immature mm. in comparison to people from other countries. Mm. You go to the likes of Europe and South Asia, especially, and even parts of America, I travel probably a good half of the world now. Okay. And, um, you know, I interacted with these people in Australia and a lot of these people have a certain level of maturity when it comes to traveling and interacting with one another and, and having debates and all this kind of stuff. And obviously yeah. after what happened recently with Brexit and Black Lives Matter and, and mm-hmm. COVID, I think people outside of England view us as a very immature society because we don't seem to have the capacity to accept other people's differences. Um, you know, you may have chosen to uh, uh, vote Brexit or remain, and all of a sudden we've got to hate each other, despite the fact that we probably share lots of characteristics. <laughs> other things, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I grew up hating Man United, but it doesn't mean to say that I hate people who support Man United. Support Man United <laughs> yeah. My best friend's a Liverpool supporter, and I, I, I mean, I hate Liverpool, but I love him, so... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if you made a judgment based on something that you, it was the one thing you could share everything with him? You could be completely in love with him and, and yeah. share everything with him, but you support something different to him. Obviously, now you don't talk to him. Or you, you yeah, know, yeah. But if we play each other, there's all out war. But after that, we're good. Like, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. And, and we don't we don't have that. We're, we're not capable of doing that. So mm. I think going out and seeing the world and traveling really opened my eyes. Um, mm. It matured me as an individual. It allowed me to find myself. I mean, I know that sounds very, very kind of like. Um, kind of spiritual as such but mm. I literally did I sat you know on some of the most amazing beaches in the world like in Sydney mm. and I looked out and I said you know I can't keep doing this to myself and I've got to change and I've got to be myself a better person and and then and then uh, without any planning my son was conceived out there and obviously I was about to be a dad so mm. that got thrown into the mix so I yeah. created the real Jumper project in December 2013 in the UK and January 2014 a month yeah. later my son was born oh wow and this world's attention was around me and I was yeah. somehow trying to be a dad without ever having a role model of being a dad <laughs> yeah. I how to be a dad I need to learn uh, so yeah there, there wasn't it wasn't necessarily like a key or pinpoint mm. moment that made me do these things it was a series of events that led me to it but yeah. it was the mindset it, I think you know, when you talked about substance abuse then and about people having like sobriety, levels of sobriety and stuff, and I, I have um, mature debates with people who are, who have suffered from substance abuse. And um, I wasn't an addict. I, I, I suffered from substance abuse, which is very different. Whereas I could go out, you know, my mates would have a quiet drink and I'd end up uh, getting absolutely lashed and buying a bottle of whiskey and ended up on a plane in Thailand. You know, oh, wow. that's the kind of person I was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know let's just have a, you know, a, 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 a couple of joints and sit around a computer playing games with my mates. Yeah. The next thing I'd have a free day binge and buying bags of cocaine and ketamine and absolutely getting, you know, yeah. annihilated and average like we're just having a, a quiet joint around, around the computer. Yeah. Around the, and I always took it to the extremes uh, completely. And I've had a few debates with people about sobriety and I think, uh, I had issues with substance abuse, but now uh, I drink, and a lot of people are very surprised about that. And I say, look, I could have a bottle of wine, or I could choose not to have a bottle of wine. And when I have a bottle of wine, if I feel like I'm not in control, I stop. You stop, yeah. And that's incredibly powerful. And I think mm. when I was traveling and when I was trying to come out of the situation of being found dead in his car, I think it was all about I needed control of my of my mind mm. more than anything else um, to get rid of these demons, to process the trauma to be in control of decisions that I was making, to not be out of control, which was really key for me because I was always out of control no matter what. Yeah. I was always seen as a class clown from a young age all the way up to drinking and, and taking drugs. It was like I could never stop. I would just keep going and going and going. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the most powerful thing. And I think when I speak to people who are, who are sobriety, going through periods of sobriety, you know, I spoke to a guy recently and he was like, I've done 10,372 days sober. I was like, that means that alcohol still controls you. And he was like, what do you yeah, mean? Yeah, like, it's such a big part of your that thinking that process. Every yeah. day, every day. You remember the second, yeah. The second, when you last had a drink. Whereas I, I can't remember when I last had a drink, yeah. but I know I've drank recently, but I don't yeah. remember 
because it doesn't control me anymore. It doesn't control my mind. It doesn't take over to the point where I'm out of control and I can stop. And it's not just drugs and it's not just alcohol. It's things like relationships mm. and it's things like um, work ethic, you know, being a father, uh, how I interact with people now as a CEO, you know, mm. people like yourselves. It's about having that amount of control. And I just said to myself, you know, I will keep my chin up no matter what while I'm walking the streets, wherever I'm going, I will keep my chin up. I will never let it drop down to the floor. And no matter what, I'll always be in control and be confident. And that grew and grew and grew. Yeah. And obviously with a project happening, and the attention it got and the positive impact that, that it was having, that just excelled even further to the point now where, you know, I can just go out and speak about the project confidently. Yeah. Yeah, you think finding a purpose is such a key process in like... It is, yeah. And yeah, it's not saying like everybody in the world has to go out and create a project. And mm. people, it might just be something as simple as uh, being a father or being better yeah. in a relationship yeah. with your partner or being a better son to your parents. Like, yeah. There's, there's, there's lots of different types of purposes. Yeah. I mean, in recent times, I've, I've kind of changed my idea of what finding your purpose is. I, I mean, growing up, finding your purpose was almost like f finding your dream job, like being a footballer yeah, yeah. or a pilot or something. But n now my, my view on finding your purpose is like voluntarily accepting responsibility for yourself. So be, treating yourself good, being good, like taking responsibility of your family, your friends, and actively caring for yourself and your body in a responsible manner. And that is finding your purpose by taking care of who yeah, you are. Because then all the other things around that come easier, I think. Yeah, most definitely. You can manage it easier. You know, you've got the support network. You don't get the emotional charge when you deal with confrontation. You can deal with it mature. Yeah. You can step back from things. You can stop doing things. You're in much, much more control. And I just think that helps us across many, many spectrums in life. Yeah. What, what brought the, um, the food junkie concept about? Because it's quite unique. Um, reading up on it and watching some of your stuff, which I've been doing for the last couple of days, just the type of person, I'm, I'm a bit of like an obsessive person. I, I discover someone and I have, to, <laughs> I have to read everything that they've got about on them. Um, so from my understanding is people don't actually pay for the food. They offer their services. I don't know if that formula still was being used now, but can you explain the process of uh, yeah, so or the formula of the business? Yeah. Yeah, so page of feel is uh, money, time, or skills. So basically, mm -hmm. you can give anything back in return to our access to food. And all the food is surplus. So yeah. it's food that was deemed not fit for sale, not necessarily not fit for consumption. Mm -hmm. So we have processes involved to make sure that food is safe to consume and people can get access to it. And there's lots of different ways that people can. So we have a social supermarket. Mm -hmm. We did outside catering, obviously, pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we do these food boxes, these like, food hampers, where you can pay a set cost and get access to it. Yeah. And the point of page of fear was never for it to be financially sustainable. It was always about value. Mm. So it's about valuing people and valuing food as a resource value rather than as a commodity. Okay. So it was about where does food come from? What is put into it in terms of energy for it to become the product that you're holding in your hand? So where does it travel? What's the carbon footprint? You know, to try and put a value on it, but then also putting a value on people and saying, just because you don't have money doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't have access to food. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a basic human right to have access to food mm -hmm. and therefore everybody should have it regardless nobody should be in control of that nobody should be judgmental when it comes to that and so we said well what do you value yourself at so you know we've had people doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things in order to have access to food well, what's we've the weird some, someone's done for food or heard them was out of the box um i think it's mainly when you find somebody with like specific skills or or, yeah. or things i mean we had a guy on the floor yesterday in the freezing cold sat outside um scraping the wood uh from the underneath piece of a liner that needed cutting for our new office uh -huh. and he had this specific tool that did it and he's on the floor and he's short and freezing yeah. hot doing it and you look at him going why are you doing that? Um, and you realise that this guy knew what he was doing, he had a skill and he was able to do it. Yeah. It was just a way of giving back. So yeah. I think that people go to like some extremes in what they can do mm. uh, because they're able to give back. Uh, but we've had things from like children coming into the cafe, like drawing pictures to dancing to doing football tricks and stuff like that. Oh, you know, nice. to get a meal yeah. from us. And it's, like, it's cool because everybody feels like they can give something to, to give back to us. Yeah. Um, and obviously they can get access to food in return. and some people can pay nothing you can walk out the door and you can walk up and give nothing yeah. that's absolutely fine how, how is that sustained uh, on a financial level so how, how does not, that yeah. not not designed to be so how are bills paid so bills paid are for over income streams so we have other mm. other little projects where we do like catering at a set cost we do weddings oh, okay. and, and, yeah. and conferences 
Um, we have the boxes now where there are ten pound and five pound for a box, and you get like thirty, forty quid worth of food oh, uh, in that box, and you pay ten pound, and you know those things are consistent and they bring income. Yeah. We get grants sometimes to support us, um, but the whole point of it was that it wasn't a sustainable concept. It was about creating change and about creating value of food and, and for people. And it's done that on an, an amazing level all over the world. You know, Page Field has been adopted in lots and lots of different sectors. Yeah. Um, and it's done some really incredible, powerful things. Um, but then we also then had to create sustainable financial models to be able to cover our salaries and overheads and vehicle costs as well. So uh, the model has evolved, especially during uh, the pandemic, because obviously we couldn't have people interacting the same way as we had previously. We couldn't have people touching. Has it been a big, big effect on the business, like in terms of... A positive effect. You know, we've gone from oh, okay. square foot, four members of staff and about 50 volunteers to 15,000 square foot, um, oh, wow. between 200 and 400 tons a month, uh, 20, 25 members of staff and about 350 volunteers. No it's way. Been, it's ever been, ever. Uh, I'm at home now. I work from home. I don't need to be at the warehouse yeah. or at the supermarket anymore. We've got staff that have been paid, living wage. That are all being are all running these um, projects for us, uh, which is an, uh, which is a good sign of success as well um, in terms of um, I'm able to walk away. Yeah, um, still functioning now. Shows, yeah, so it shows that the uh, the project can stand on its own two feet without it being all about Adam Smith or going through Adam Smith. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's a sign of success. And then the next sign of success is how do we create a world where the real jumper project isn't needed anymore? You know? Mm. Are you looking into international ventures or is it strictly, are you strictly focusing yeah, in the UK? Yeah, I spoke to a guy yesterday from Russia who's teaching the Real Jumper Project as children in school. Yeah. Uh, we speak to some companies in Saudi Arabia who are dealing with things around food. Oh, amazing. And it offers off the back of the LinkedIn post, which had 5.3 yeah. million hits, I think, in total, yeah. um, of messages from people all over the world saying, you know, when you come to our country or anything, get in touch and you know, we'll be there to yeah. support you. Um, at the moment, it's just about sustaining what we've got on the ground in Leeds and then hopefully looking at that as a replicable model across the country. Mm. If that's successful, we don't anticipate being along in the year doing that. Uh, and hopefully come 22, 23, we can start looking at international uh, and, and That's amazing. Well, so that's the, that's the aim. What, what, what's the aim for the next, I don't know, five years or so for the organization? Where are you looking Same to take it? it always has been from day one, feed the world. Um, yeah. How many people have you fed so far, just just for the viewers to know? Around uh, 13 and a half to 14 million people. Wow. Um, Since 2011? 2013. So 13 years, sorry. So December 2013, uh, we, we started, we incorporated, and um, at the height of our network in 2016, we had 126 projects in seven countries, mm. and that included Israel, um, Berlin, Japan, South Africa, some in Melbourne, and the um, uh, majority of them in the UK. Um, yeah. and, and a couple in France, we had La Rochelle and one in Paris as well, which was, which was incredible. We've kind of devolved slightly now, so we've only got one project in Leeds, but we cover bigger areas now. Yeah. So we, uh, we redistribute food all over the country, we collect food from all over the country, and we've got large Arctic lorries that deliver food to us rather than running around in our cars, collecting on the back of the supermarket. Um, yeah. dealing with food on a big scale now than ever before so it's grown exponentially in a very short space of time um, but it's now about sustaining it obviously removing me from the equation and about how we can grow that on a national level mm -hmm. um, which shouldn't be too hard given the fact we've got national contacts and um, we're part of the supply chain on an international level and obviously we're very very vocal about what we do so obviously you've heard about us and you've seen the things that we do but we've never been mm -hmm. shy about shouting out about what we do and um, yeah, the post that I put out recently, obviously the LinkedIn post, which got such amazing um, exposure. Yeah, I got, I got sent that about three times from from three different people because everyone knows the type of work I'm I'm into and the things that I'm interested in, and everyone's like, "Oh, amazing story! Read this, read this!" And I got sent on the same day, actually. <laughs> I think everyone must have seen it around the same time. It it kind of spiraled around um, LinkedIn. Yeah, and four days before New Year's Eve, and it was it still carries on now. I'm still yeah. getting messages and posts. I guess. Yeah. Anything between 100 and 200 connections a day off the back of it. Um, oh, wow. It's been great. I've got a book deal out of it, so I'm co-writing a book with a co-author. Um, well, what's the name of the book? It's going to be called 10. Yeah, we hope we can definitely chat once the book is out. I'll have a read and then we'll have a talk about it. And, yeah, Absolutely. And I hope to get, I've got 30 chapters to write. I'm on chapter three at the moment. I've just finished that. And um, I'm hoping to do 3,000 words a day. Doing yeah. 3,000 word autobiography, so hopefully I should be able to get it out by February, hopefully. 
Yeah, oh, that's, that's amazing. Cool. Look forward to that, that's man. Adam cool. Smith, it seems like you're doing God's work, man, which is amazing. So just keep it up. Um, w- w- what is um, a Nova Monk? Because what's a zero waste beer? Because I mean, obviously, I got I got drawn into the beer side of things now. <laughs> <laughs> is there is a beer that you're brewing yourself and producing, and what is it? The- yeah, it was a beer. It was a company called Nova Monk in Leeds, who are an independent brewery, amazing yeah. organisation. And we just got together and said, let's create this kind of like uh, beer made out of surplus food and just highlight the kind of um, the capacity, I guess, and the the audacity of of surplus food. So mm. we created this. Uh, pear and brioche uh, ale which had champagne yeast in it and it was all from yeah. surface ingredients and and um, we were just conscious of everything we did on the whole process mm. so like the waste hops went to a worm farm and the bottles were recyclable and the, the labeling was all recyclable and yeah that's the point where we called it a zero waste beer it's like it wasn't just the fact that um, it had come from waste ingredients it was about the impact of the entire journey of the product Mm. And about the impact that that had on the planet as well. So it's still being produced. Um, I don't think it's. I think it's a one-off thing. But we're okay. still in a, we're still in a relationship with um, Northern Monk, and we still mm. um, have got ideas about coming up with like more consistent themed yeah. ways throughout the year. So we want to do some kind of uh, parking beer towards uh, Halloween time, and then something a bit more festive over the mm. Christmas period, maybe this year, yeah. but obviously last year. Are all these like, ventures that are uh, going to support um, Royal Junk Food. Or is this yeah, all the crowd things come towards us, and we get yeah, we get a, a, a remuneration from it. Yeah. Um, sometimes, other times, it's just about highlighting the issue and a bit of exposure, and a bit of media attention off the back of the problem, and mm. uh, that's great for us because obviously, like you, you heard about us and about the yeah. product. Just it just highlights the the problem uh, and allows people to to engage with it more. Yeah, amazing. Um, so two more questions before I let you go. So how can people go about sort of like doing more in regards to waste on an individual level? Because sometimes I think people ask questions of the major corps and ask questions of people like yourself. But um, what, what can I do as an individual to do better and, and to um, sort of have my input into this mission? So obviously, one of the key messages that we try to get people across is like you should uh, act locally and think globally. So mm. uh, that means being very, very conscious of your consumer habits. So mm. not only where you shop, but what you shop and what you buy. Um, I, I a plant-based diet. You know, I don't contribute to the eating of animal protein, but I have nothing against anybody that does. Mm. But it's more about where you source it from um, and what impact it has. You know, processed animal protein from all over the world that has a very, very detrimental impact on our planet. Um, packaging, obviously be more conscious of like what food is wrapped in and obviously where you're getting it from and just considering the ethics of that. And there are just really simple steps that we can make um, to start making that change. But obviously on a bigger scale, you can get involved with projects like ourselves, environmentally, and a lot of amazing, great environmental mm-hmm. projects out there. Um, there's lots and lots of actions that we can take as individuals that are going to have uh, a betterment on it so you know even just um there's a there's a, there's a great thing out at the moment from chris packham about uh doing bird surveys so just looking out your window and just writing down the birds that you see how often you see them where you see them and then you can just upload it online and that gives a really really good understanding of people like chris packham to understand the ecology and the habitats and stuff that's going on around the uk to understand what's happening environmentally and obviously then once they understand the information from that we can start looking at what impacts it. So does food impact it, logistics impact it, mm. transport, all these other things. And that's when change can start happening. So it's all these like little small acts that you can do, which is what I said earlier about thinking globally, is like it has a uh, contribution towards the bigger picture. Um, hopefully, when I get down to Essex, uh, yeah. you can start ordering a food from us, uh, from the Real Group Project. You can get yeah, most definitely, man. I'll, I'll be down um, when you come down to sunny Essex. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And just spread yeah. the word and, and, and tell yeah. people about uh, who we are, what we're doing, you know, the big people yeah. that you're not aware of. Like, quite sure. and, and where can people support your organisation directly, though? So I'll, I'll probably get all the links from you afterwards anyway. I'll, I'll source it from yeah, yeah. your socials. And, yeah, yeah exactly. So, you know, we've got Facebook and Instagram and all the yeah. other platforms that I don't really care about. <laughs> uh, we've got TIJP.com, which is our website, which is where the main traffic okay. uh, is diverted to. And um Obviously, I've got my own pages as well as an individual where you can keep up to date with things that I do. So I'm doing a speech uh, yeah. in February, a networking event for a green forward thinking. So I do a lot of speeches around mental health and environment and also around uh, being a business owner and entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, 
and the social entrepreneur especially so you, you know anything that you uh, find on the project you can pretty much find me as well and, and get involved okay. but like i said it's all about making those conscious decisions about our impacts um, you know, the next time you order a takeaway, the next time you go purchase food, the next time you purchase something from Amazon, what impact is it having on the planet? And although it may be convenient, uh, it's slowly destroying our planet. And that's that's getting quicker and quicker by the day, unfortunately. Yeah, I appreciate that, Adam. And it's, it's all about being conscious of what you're doing and um, knowing where that is. And, and I think the issue with that most of the time is that we don't have the necessary education. And that's why it's great to have people that are actively like searching for the information and putting it out there for us to understand. And that's why I wanted you to have to be on here just to bring that to the consciousness and to make people understand that whenever you do purchase something it has an effect whether you see yeah. or feel it or not it is so adam smith i really truly appreciate you coming on let's do humans podcast and 